So today we are very pleased to welcome our first uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Victoria Nembaware, who is joining us all the way from South Africa. Vicky is the project manager for the Sickle Cell Africa Data Coordinating Center, where she directs research capacity development and training. Vicky is particularly involved in study design, data management planning, and big data analytics and an, as well as ontology development, all applied to the research of sickle cell disease. So Vicky carried her doctoral studies in bioinformatics at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and was also a visiting postdoc and at Stanford University. Um, she held different positions in the public health sector, including information communication technology, monitoring and evaluation, as well as teaching. Uh, for example, one of the things she did was developing a mobile phone app to engage and educate the public on heredity and health in Africa. Um, so today, Vicky will share with us her experiences in designing and implementing large-scale policy-driven efforts to combat sickle cell disease in the sub-Saharan region. Um, and she will tell us about this focus and strategy uh, of, the, of her institute, which was founded in 2017, so rather recently. Um, yeah, we are really looking forward uh, to her talk, um, where we'll listen about delivering res results uh, when, you have, when you are in a resource-constrained healthcare facilities and how the African genetic diversity impacts disease outcomes. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great privilege um, to present this um, seminar on behalf of the Sickle Africa Data Coordinating Center, or SADAC. We are based at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. It's actually winter, so the weather is similar to what's on the photograph. We are supported by the University of Cape Town Clinical Research Center and by Ashray Bionet. Our center, which I'll call SADA going forward, is led by Professor Ambrose Wonkam, who's a medical geneticist with a background in uh, managing sickle cell patients uh, for many years. He's supported in this leadership role by Professor Nicola Moda. Our team is multidisciplinary with lots of uh, people coming from a diverse range of backgrounds, including bioinformatics, um, LC, um, lab and biorepository management, mathematical modeling, epidemiology, and so on. A very quick overview of my talk. I'll give a little bit of background on sickle cell disease. Uh, most of you might be familiar with this uh, disease as it's a classical example, which is included in most high school textbooks. Um, and I hope to highlight with this talk, the reality on the ground, far from the textbook experiences you might have had. I will um, discuss a little bit about the SADAC mission and vision and how we build partnerships and also about the work we do in building a registry, um, our LC work training and research. Sickle cell disease is actually a group of blood disorders with the most common one being sickle cell anemia, which is caused by a single nucleotide polymorphism, which causes um, normal blood red cells to become sickle celled in shape, which then distorts the ability to transport oxygen around the body. And it also results in clogging or these sickle cell shaped um, um, cells clogging the blood vessels, which can lead to a range of symptoms and complications. And these symptoms and complications, people don't still understand, we don't still understand them because they can range from mild to severe and chronic. Unfortunately, our own African beliefs and cultures can distort our understanding of the disease. In addition, most of our healthcare workers are ill-equipped or ill-educated to actually care for the complications that people have. When my oldest daughter was three years old, friends introduced us to another professional young couple who had another three-year-old daughter. But unfortunately, this daughter was very, this little girl was very lonely because no one in their circles wanted to play with her. She had a tendency of screaming uncontrollably. Um, 
you know, unconsolable for hours on end. Her eyes would turn yellowish. Her hands would swell every now and again, and her feet. She got infections very easily. She got tired very easily. She couldn't play that, that, that well. So um, this young couple had really basically given up trying to socialize. So we got in touch with them and our kids started to play. We learned later on that this young couple had given up taking the child to the emergency centers here in Cape Town, South Africa, because the healthcare workers could never seem to make a really meaningful diagnosis of the child. The neighbors had first suspected child abuse, and then eventually they concluded that this child was bewitched or possessed by, us, by some spirit. And unfortunately, this young couple was actually beginning to believe this um, beliefs from the neighbors. And this is kind of the scenario which is in Africa, and these are young professionals, what more of people who have lower education and lower literacy levels. Uh, the prevalence of sickle cell disease is very frequent in Africa. Africa contributes more than 75% of the live births of sickle cell, and it is estimated that over 300 babies are born with sickle cell globally every year. And basically the reason why there is such high prevalence in, in Africa is because of malaria. People who inherit the mutation or are carriers of the mutation are more resistant to malaria. And for a long time, sickle cell was a neglected um, disease um, globally. No one cared about it. Um, but unfortunately, or, or fortunately, a group of um, advocates from Africa made of politicians, of clinicians and healthcare workers all got together and lobbied the United Nations. And in 2008, they were successful in that sickle cell disease became recognized as a public health problem. And as you can see on this red map, although sickle cell disease was discovered in 1910, it was only more than 80 years later that the first drug um, was FDA approved to be used for sickle cell disease. And this drug was even a repurposed drug. It, had been, it hadn't been developed specifically for sickle cell disease. SADC was, was actually initiated in 2017, and, and we're hoping that with this coordinated effort, we'll be able to contribute or facilitate the contribution of new drug therapies that can improve um, the life uh, quality of life of sickle cell patients and even increase um, their uh, lifespan. One very well um, uh, accepted uh, resource for increasing research and understanding diseases are, uh, are registries. And unfortunately, um, there isn't a registry in most of the hard, reach, hard heat regions um, of sickle cell disease. Uh, on this map in 2017, we did a very informal quick scan of what are the registries out there uh, on sickle cell disease. Uh, we realized that if you see on the map, the red uh, uh, parts mark the really hard hit sickle cell regions and the blue dots are the registries. And as you can see, there is a disconnect of registries and, and, and um, the hardest, reach, uh, hardest hit regions. Um, so there is an urgent need to really develop sickle cell registries and develop longitudinal studies. So SADC, as mentioned previously, is really hoping and, and working towards building research capacity in sickle cell disease so that we can understand this disease better and, 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 and address it better, and also increasing healthcare capacity uh, through coordination of sickle cell stakeholders across the globe and especially in sub-Saharan Africa. We also are strengthening research training, LC, ethical, legal, social implications, um, and healthcare. And for coordination, we, um, we are specifically funded by the um, National Institute of Health, USA, to support SPACO, which is the Sickle Pan-African Research Consortium. This consortium is headed by Professor Julie McCanney, who is based at, in, in Tanzania. And the SPACO sites are linked to hospitals or healthcare facilities uh, where they specialize mainly in sickle cell disease. And these sites are based in Ghana, 
Nigeria and Tanzania, some of the hardest hit countries by sickle cell disease. Together, SADAC and Sparkle, we form what we call the Sickle in Africa Consortium. In addition to supporting Sparkle, we also build networks and, and partnerships with others, amongst other sickle cell disease um, stakeholders, clinicians, and researchers spread across 21 countries in Africa. And also, um, we've got um, um, researchers uh, from our network who are based in Brazil, Jamaica, US, and, and UK. And we're hoping that Asia will join this network soon. And this loose connection of researchers um, in sickle cell disease is called the Sickle Cell Pan-African Network. And we created a sickle cell disease ontology working group out of the Sickle in Africa, um, um, sickle in Africa Consortium and SPAN. And based on this network, we managed to create a community supported, um, a community supported sickle cell disease um, ontology. And this ontology is based around the root um, of hemoglobinopathies. And this disease ontology actually addresses different sections of the um, different issues and um, areas of the disease itself from from quality of life and care to research, to diagnostics, to therapeutics. We are, um, we've translated this ontology into French and we're currently um, uh, translating, finalized translation into Portuguese. And also uh, we, um, we have developed a layman's version of the ontology for patients to empower patients about their own health. As most of you might have noticed, uh, the title, is sickle cell disease of this talk, or no, also known as a banana cell. And one of the, um, the key deliverable of, of our ontology, which we're very proud of, is that this ontology has got terms and, and, and descriptions that do not exist in other ontologies. And I just highlighted there with one example. Sickle cell disease was coined in 1910 out of an African context. People don't, most people don't even know what a sickle is. So most of the clinicians, especially uh, Ambrose, um, advocated that we create another synonym for sickle cell, which is banana cell disease. It makes it easier for, for, for researchers, for healthcare workers to explain what sickle cell disease is to um, other African um, uh, patients or stakeholders. Um, for the registry itself, we have over 10,000 patients who've been recruited into our registry because of the high uh, mortality rate and the reduced lifespan of sickle cell disease. Most of our um, registry participants are children. We're working hard towards making this registry fair, starting internally while we address data sharing and governance issues, and also for us to mine the data efficiently before we make it available to the general research community. So we've got a dashboard and a queryable database in-house. Um, and um, on this graph, you can actually see that um, Nigeria is contributing the largest number of sickle cell disease because um, it actually has a higher prevalence or the highest, uh, one of the highest on the continent. Uh, because our team is made up of data analysts and people who've got lots of experience analyzing data, this was a really exciting opportunity for, for the data analysts in our team to be involved in addressing data quality issues, which take up a lot of our time when we use publicly available data sets. So um, for, for this aspect, we did a lot of work together with the consortium of developing data standards and data elements which are harmonized across the sites. And we agreed on a core data set on, of 66 um, elements, which each site um, collects, and they're free to collect anything else. But these core data elements, which are key to understanding sickle cell, are being collected the same across the sites that we're working with. 
again, to emphasize data quality assurance, um, we also have data quality certificates. When the sites um, send data to our data coordinating center, we check it thoroughly for quality and we send it back again to the sites to correct whenever we've got um, any issues. Um, and this is something that we do on a regular basis whenever data is shared, um, is, is uh, copied across, as we are custodians of the data and also are responsible for the data quality. In terms of data collection, most of the sites we work with, or some of them, were using paper-based data collection and um, Paper-based has got many problems. If a fire comes, you know, your, your, your data will all be gone. So we moved and are promoting a tablet-based data collection where most of our sites um, do not have stable internet connectivity. So they collect their data using tablets uh, offline and whenever they've got connectivity, it's uploaded onto servers. And we're using red, the red cap system for this data collection. And we also um, do site visits to actually make sure that um, data is being collected in an ethical way and in a standardized manner. And in the ethos of building capacity, we also purchase servers for each site to make sure that this data is being backed up and we don't have any data losses and also to make data transferable, um, easier to transfer um, um, to the uh, SADC uh, center. For the ethical, legal, and social implications, we've had um, a lot of heated debates about these issues. And um, we, 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 we cannot say we've addressed all the issues around, around data sharing and data governance, but we did try to implement and to address a lot of these ethical issues um, right at the beginning. So before the data collection started, we brought all the stakeholders together and we tried to look at each and every aspect that we could think of and to address it as much as possible. For instance, we actually assessed ethical, legal, any restrictions that could hinder data sharing in the future um, at an institutional level and at a national level for each country. We assessed consent forms that were being used by each side, which ended up um, making us actually develop templates together with the sites, which would promote data sharing later on. We're still grappling with other issues and um, are now designing research studies around this. Ascent, most of our participants are children. Do they really understand the consent? Um, can we develop graphics or cartoons for them to understand better? benefit sharing. How are we going to share any new um, discoveries that come out of this data with the participants, with the rest of the, the stakeholders, data access committees, who's going to govern this data efficiently? Right now, SADC is trying as best as we can, but do we need an external board, data security issues? There are so many issues that we're still trying to address, and we are doing this um, with patients as partners, which is really one of the ethos of the work that we do. We work collaboratively with partners. We've got patient um, uh, representatives from each of the four countries that we work in, from South Africa, we've got Paul Arafa from Tanzania, and Adebola, who's 61 years old and a sickle cell disease patient, um, which is fantastic, and she's from Nigeria, and we also have Emmanuel from, from, from um, Ghana. We also support their advocacy work. I've just highlighted there one of um, um, the president for the Sikusa South Africa support group, Gravages, who was featured in a Nature paper recently due to some uh, links we, we made for him. We also um, create public engagement material, and we're continually trying to improve this uh, material. We've got a fact sheet explaining what sickle cell disease is, hoping that that will reach far. We celebrate World Sickle Cell Day, which is coming up very soon on the 19th of June. This year, we've developed a video explaining our work. And also, we plan on um, sharing aggregated data as a way of feeding back 
our progress to the patients because I'm sure they were, would like to know what we've been doing with the data we've been collecting. In terms of training, um, we also really focus on competency or skills-based training approach. Um, the one training we've implemented and has been incrementally going more intensive, getting more intensive and more complex, um, more advanced is data capturing and data management um, because our training for the registry is really centered around the data management cycle. We have now reached out to um, other people developing data stewardship training so that we can finalize the training we've got. We've got a standard operating procedure platform because you can create standard operating procedures to facilitate standardization of processes and of data across the sites, but how can you assess that people are actually reading and taking note of these um, soaps and uh, following them? So we've developed a platform which then assesses comprehension of, um, of all our site members, and we are now ready to pilot and, and assess how effective that will be. Um, we also have training that we have developed. Um, most of this training and system administration and also manuscript development so that we can promote first and last author publications from our consortia. Um, most of the um, uh, training material that I've described here is currently being finalized and will be implemented towards um, the end of this year, but the data management um, and capturing is um, something that we do continuously during site visits and in workshop and at sites. And one of our flagship training, which we're really proud of, is the big data analytics. This is really aimed at equipping the sites to analyze their own data, both epidemiological data and also genomic data that they are starting to um, produce from, from, from the patients. Um, and one other thing is we strategically um, recruited data management, data managers into the big data analytics course. And this was to actually promote the data managers to appreciate the importance of data quality. And what better way um, it is to actually promote data quality by making them you know, carry their own water, then they will learn that the value of each of the drop, the value of each data element and the quality is really important for data quality. And we're hoping to also assess uh, the impact of this pilot um, based on real data from the data quality. Um, uh, and we're hoping that the data quality will improve substantially now that the data managers have got some uh, data analysis skills. Um, in terms of healthcare, our team contributes heavily to the African Genomic Medicine Training Initiative, which is really geared at upskilling nurses in, um, in understanding um, uh, genomics and, and, and just how to address that in the healthcare. And during this training, as well as our personal experiences, we have observed that sickle cell is really important for us to develop a separate module which specializes mainly on sickle cell. We've got a clinician who's um, now focusing on, um, on just creating that module, and we hope to, to actually implement that uh, this year as well. Um, in addition, we look backwards. How can we promote uptake of careers? How can we promote interest and understanding in genomics and in life sciences in general? And we do this through the MGen Africa platform where we uh, provide high school learners from disadvantaged um, areas with role models from our team and our networks and collaborators. And we also have online quizzes which then happen um, physically once a year um, here um, in a very um, huge quiz competition where there are big prizes. We, we've been doing this with the Department of Education in Cape Town uh, for, this, um, for, for, for a few districts, and we're hoping that this will be scaled up to other countries. There are already two countries that are very interested in taking this model to inspire the young um, upcoming and future researchers. 
And in terms of healthcare, Sparkle, our sister consortia, has developed standards of care guidelines, which most of our training for healthcare workers will be based on. And what's fantastic about these healthcare guidelines, they've just not been adopted from el um, elsewhere. They've been adapted for the resource limited setting. For example, for instances where exchange transfusion would be ideal, they recommend top-up transfusion because that's what's available. And for newborn screening, there are some places where there isn't um, a newborn screening or you've run out of um, um, tests to test whether a baby is, um, has got sickle cell. Um, they recommend that you actually treat the little baby with folic acid and penicillin prophylaxis until you can perform um, a screening test um, in the near future when the resources become available. We're also using the sickle cell disease ontology as a framework to design um, applications which can help healthcare workers with better diagnosis and better care for the patients. And also some of these um, applications are mobile phone based. Um, one is almost complete uh, for active surveillance of pain so that we understand pain better if we've got live data coming from from, from the patients, because sometimes a patient goes into a crisis because the temperature has changed. Are there other things that trigger pain crisis? These are the things we would like to collect and it will also enhance the data in our registry. The potential of um, impact of this research is what's exciting the team most, um, a lot, um, amongst other things. Uh, for example, one of the most cited paper, which I've already cited, which um, estimated over 300 live births of sickle cell disease in, um, uh, globally, is based on mathematical modeling. We're hoping with data from this consortium, we'll be able to provide concrete data and even better estimates of the prevalence of sickle cell disease, we'll be better able to understand why there is so much variability in, um, in, in, in the manifestation of these diseases in different people and different haplotypes and different um, uh, sickle cell diseases. We're also hoping to contribute, make our small contribution to increasing the African genomic data that's available um, in public databases and to promote retrospective data analysis, um, because there's a lot of data that exists in individual sites using the ontology. Uh, we are now, we've already piloted um, harmonizing existing data. Can the sickle cell disease ontology be used as a framework for, for developing other genetic disease ontologies? We've already done so or proved um, that is possible by developing the hearing impairment ontology based on this framework. In addition, um, a question that we're grappling with and trying to address, could sickle cell be, disease be, could it facilitate um, precision medicine uh, through multi-omics data, harmonization and integration for machine learning algorithms based on um, how this data can be brought together and be harmonized using the sickle cell disease um, ontology. I would like to thank the um, SADC team and um, the entire Sparkle team and our NHLA BI and funders. Um, that's our website and our, our, our um, Twitter handle. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you once again. I welcome questions. Great, thank you very much, Vicky, for that great talk. Um, it looks like you were exactly on time. In fact, we have time for one question and I want to remind all the participants that after this, um, there's the Meet Vicky session, so uh, further follow-up questions can be asked. But um, the top question that we have right now is coming from Anika Gable, and she's asking the question, how much are the current drugs improving quality of life, and are they affordable for most patients? Uh, unfortunately, right now, most of the patients are treated using folic acid, and um, antibiotics to try and limit infections. Um, there's also hydroxyl, but it's not accessible to everyone. Uh, most countries, patients have to purchase. Um, in Ghana, um, uh, the site in Ghana has managed to partner with Novartis and the government 
to try and improve access to hydroxia for, for their patients. And this is a model that we're hoping can be implemented throughout Africa. And we're hoping it will increase the quality of life and uh, probably also um, reduce the mortality rates. Uh, but yes, um, we're hoping maybe this work could lead to better, in the long run, uh, more affordable drugs. Um, yeah, great question. All right, well, thank you for that answer. I think now we'll um, end this session and go to the um, meet the speaker session. And with, there's um, a number of other questions that I've been collecting so we can continue there. So we'd like to thank you again for the great talk and starting off uh, Sib Days 2020. Thank you so much.